going to be talking about hearing God's voice in some ways. Jerry. You want me to talk louder? Oh, God. I thought you didn't believe in me. Uh, th 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 that's just an expression. I'm more than that, and I want you to spread the word. Me? Spread what word? That I am. I... Excuse me. Are you all right? Yeah. No. It's a long story. Well, I like stories. I'm considered a bit of a storyteller myself. My husband? Have you heard of New York's Noah? <laughs> the guy who's building the ark. That's him. I love that story. Noah and the ark. You know, a lot of people miss the point of that story. They think it's about God's wrath and anger. They love it when God gets angry. What is the story about then, the ark? Well, I think it's a love story about believing in each other. You know, the animals showed up in pairs. Mm -hmm. you know, they stood by each other, side by side, just like Noah and his family. Everybody entered the ark side by side. But my husband says God told him to do it. What do you do with that? Sounds like an opportunity. Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, do you think God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If they prayed for courage, does God give them courage? Or does he give them opportunity to be courageous? If someone prayed for the family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does it give them opportunities to love each other? <laughs> well, I gotta run. A lot of people. Put God first. Put God first in everything you do. Everything that you think you see in me, everything that I've accomplished, everything that you think I have, and I have a few things. Everything that I have is by the grace of God. Understand that. It's a gift. 40 years ago, March 27th, 1975, it was 40 years ago, uh, just this past March, I was flunking out of college. I had a 1.7 grade point average. I hope none of you can relate. <laughs> At a 1.7 grade point average. I was sitting in my mother's beauty shop. They still call it beauty shop now? What they call it? Yeah, I was sitting in the beauty parlor. I was sitting in my mother's beauty parlor and I'm looking in the mirror and I see behind me this woman under the dryer. And every time she looked up, she every time I looked up, she was looking at me, just looking me in the eye. And I didn't know who she was and I said, you know, she said, somebody give me a pen, give me a pencil. I have a prophecy. March 27, 1975, she said, boy, you are going to travel the world and speak to millions of people. Now, mind you, I was flunked out of college. I'm thinking about joining the army. I didn't know what I was going to do. And she's telling me I'm going to travel the world and speak to millions of people. Well, I have traveled the world. And I have spoke to millions of people. But that's not the most important thing, the success that I had. The most important thing is that what she taught me and what she told me that day has stayed with me since. I've been protected. I've been directed. I've been corrected. I've kept God in my life and has kept me humble. I didn't always stick with him, but he always stuck with me. So stick with him in everything you do. If you think you want to do what you think I've done, then do what I've done and stick with God. Number two. A relationship is a two-way deal. If you're going to have a relationship with God, you have to put something in and, and to get something out. Unfortunately, many Christians, we ask God for things. We petition him for things. We want things from him. But we're not always there listening to what he wants to tell us. We can't hear God's voice without a relationship with him. 
Through that relationship, God gives us the person of the Holy Spirit to live in us and to work in us. The Holy Spirit uses a lot of different ways to speak to us, just like in that video. I mean, I don't know how many of us will ever hear him through an audible voice on our radio, but that is, that is a way that's been portrayed in the movies. Um, and then through people. In the second one, Morgan Freeman was playing the part of God in that movie. But sometimes he uses people to come alongside and speak to us. And other times, it's through prophecy, like the woman in the beauty parlor spoke to Denzel Washington. There are different ways that God uses to speak to people. Without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we have no way of hearing or knowing what God wants for us. And, and there's no way that he'll ever become the loudest voice in our lives without the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he would send his followers, the Holy Spirit, to live in them and help them. And he said that in John, and our account is John 14, 15 to 21. I'd like you to follow along with me as I read that. He says, if you love me, Jesus said, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you. Now and later, he will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Jesus said that when we have a relationship with him, when we love him, we obey his commandments. When we live in that relationship with God, we love him, we respect him, we want to please him. And that's how it's a two-way thing. And then he sends the Holy Spirit to live in us. And he said the Holy Spirit will never leave us. Jesus, as the Son of God, when he was here, he was a man. He was limited in time and space to who he was, to a physical body. He couldn't be everywhere all the time. But he could send us the Holy Spirit who could live in us and be in us all the time and be with us everywhere we go. God is a spirit, and the spirit can live in each of us and lead us to all truth. God wants to do that. He wants to do that in our personal relationship with him. To hear God, we must have the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. A.W. Tozer wrote this in a book that he calls um, The Counselor. He says, spell this out in capital letters. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not enthusiasm, he's not courage, he isn't some warm, fuzzy feeling that's around us. He is a person. He is not, he's not just energy, he's not something out in the universe. He is a person. He, might not, he doesn't have physical, material substance, but he has all the qualities of a person. And he is not like Jack Frost, who exemplifies winter. I mean, that he is not something like that. He is a person, the same as you are a person, even though he, he doesn't have the body that we do. He has individuality. He is one being, not, not another. He has will and intelligent. He has hearing, he has knowledge, he has sympathy, he has the ability to love, to see, and to think. He can do all these things. He can hear, he can speak, he can desire, he can grieve, he can rejoice. He is a person. So if I would ask you today, now you can't say what I just said, but what, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word Holy Spirit? When you hear about, when, when you hear that phrase or hear that name? Conscience, a ghost. Anything else? Those aren't bad. Those are good. I mean, we all have our responses right away. When I was growing up, we always called it the Holy Ghost. And so I probably thought of him that way, too. I never thought of it till just now when, when I just heard that. Yeah, we think of him as something that's kind of fuzzy out there, kind of not all there. And maybe some of you would have thought the third person of the Trinity, comforter, counselor, guide, teacher. Holy Spirit is God. Often when we think of the Holy Spirit, we kind of put him down like on third place. Because we always say, Father, 
Son, Holy Spirit. And why do we do that? One of the reasons possibly would be because Jesus did it on, in one verse in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. He said, to go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So maybe we rank them in importance and the Holy Spirit's kind of one of the lesser parts of God or lesser gods. And then we think the Father's more important and then there's a Son. But you know, in scripture, other than Matthew 28, 19, there is no other time that he is put in third place. In fact, it, out of the six time, of, of the many times that he is listed, there's, um, he is listed at, there's Father, Holy Spirit, and Son. Sometimes Holy Spirit, Son, and Father, or Son, Holy Spirit, and Father. And if you're a mathematician, there are six ways you can put those three people in order, right? And he is, they are listed that way all six times in the Bible. So God made sure that nobody had more importance or less when he was listing them in, in scripture. Others think that the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned until the day of Pentecost. I've heard that, but that's incorrect. He is listed as early as Genesis 1-2. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. In Psalm 51, King David is pouring out his heart in repentance over what he did with Bathsheba. And listed in his prayer in verse 11, he said, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And the Holy Spirit was present at conception. In Luke 1:35, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby born to you will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. It was also the Holy Spirit who was present at the baptism of Christ. Luke 3.22 says, The Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. Holy Spirit is not some created being or force that poof, magically appeared on the day of Pentecost. He was always here because he is God. He was, he's not some third string player waiting in the, in the game to, to replace Jesus. He has been there from the very beginning. He's been active through the entire realm of history from the day one until present time because he is God. So maybe the question we should be asking today is, so what? Why do we care who even is as long as he's around? Well, it has a lot to do with it. it everything. It has everything to do with you. When Jesus made the promise to the disciples that the Holy Spirit would be present in their lives, the promise wasn't limited to those 12 disciples. He said, I am giving you the Holy Spirit. And that is to each one of us. He isn't an option like power windows or the kind of radio you put in your new car. He is, when you accept Jesus as your Savior, when you accept God into your life, the Holy Spirit is given to you to live in you and to help you to become the person that God created you to be. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is the very center of the Christian life and you cannot live an obedient, productive, fruitful Christian life without the Holy Spirit's presence. So what does he do? One of the best things the Holy Spirit does is gives us power. Acts 1.8, Jesus told his disciples, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Power, that's an incredible concept. Yesterday, how many of you were without power? Yeah, home was, our house was, a lot of our neighbors were, yeah, we're, Power's a big deal, like yesterday. Pretty hard to run the AC. <laughs> Pretty hard to, do, to, to flush the toilet more than once. All of a sudden, you're out of water. I mean, you need power in a lot of ways, and we don't even think about it until it's gone sometimes. Yesterday, when I was at home, I thought, Gary mentioned something about the sump pump, and I thought, oh, I forgot about the sump pump at church not having power, so I better get back here. I might be mopping. But it was already turned on here, thank goodness, by then. <laughs> Otherwise, I was looking for generators because, I mean, we have three, four freezers going and three freezers going and refrigerators and we have a sump pump that is necessary. So we need power. And that is an, we need that kind of power. And for us to live the life 
that God has called us to live, we have to have his power. There is no way we can do it by ourselves. I mean, when you become a Christian, you start reading God's word, you look at that thinking, I can't do that. I mean, I can't live the way God wants me to live. It's impossible. And if you're feeling that way, you're right. It is impossible by yourself. You need the Holy Spirit. That's why God gives us the Holy Spirit, so that we can have his power. And I love the concept of that promise that the Holy Spirit, when he comes in and controls our lives, we receive power. Not that, you know, we want to just have power to zap and do different things, but it's, and it's not the power that we can just turn on and off and but it's a power that God gives us, and it's one that will fill us and will help us to do, and it's wonderful and incredible. It's dynamic. It's life-changing power. It's a power we need to conquer our bad habits and to start good ones. It's a power we need to tell others about Jesus. It's a power we need to do everything that God wants us to do and to be. God doesn't expect us to do it alone. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even want us to do it alone. He sent us an advocate, the counselor, to come alongside us, to come into our lives. And he said he will never leave us or forsake us. Each day you can pray and talk to God, and the Holy Spirit is asking us, he says, let me come in to your life, and you will have power. So through the Holy Spirit, we can experience God's love. In Romans 5, 5, it says, and this expectation will not disappoint us, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Christianity places a pretty high premium on love. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, to, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God's love. To have a love like that, we have to have the Holy Spirit, because it says, For God so loved the world, that means every single person in it. And it's hard, we cannot do that by ourselves. We can't love every single person in our lives without the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Some people are much harder for us to love than others. And so God gives us that we can love unconditionally, and we can only get that through him. So what's the bottom line? When we have a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is at home within us. And we have peace and love. Romans 8, 6 says, if your sinful nature controls your mind, there is death. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. So God wants to speak to us. And he does that in a number of ways. And we saw a few on that video, but we're going to talk about 12 unique ways that God chooses to do this. Number one, he speaks through the Holy Spirit. In fact, all 12 ways are through the Holy Spirit's power. Holy Spirit should be the central and main foundation every time Jesus speaks. God speaks to us, be it when we're reading his word, through a person or a circumstance. The Holy Spirit acts like our inner witness to reveal and confirm deep things to us. Through discernment, it's when we just have a solid knowing and when we can discern what God wants us to learn from something. Like what, there's a tug at your heart or a gut feeling. You can recognize the Holy Spirit talking to you th through, through those things that are happening in your life and through all these different things we're going to talk about. God speaks through Scripture. God's Word is the number one undiluted way in which He speaks. The Bible says that God has exalted His Word above His name. This tells us about God's integrity, what He says He will do. He will do, and we can always trust his word. Whatever is in this word is true, and we can trust it. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to wonder. God speaks to us through his word. We might stumble on a Bible verse, but God will continue to speak to us if we just open ourselves up to listen to what he has to say. And we don't have to wonder because it's right here before us. God can speak through music. For those of us that are bent towards music, that might be what, maybe that's the number one way God speaks to us is through music. There'll be a verse, there'll be a song that just resonates in our hearts and speaks to us. You know, one time, I don't remember what we were going through at home, but it was a song that said, even, even when times are tough, God is tougher. I mean, it was, it hasn't been, it, it kind of disappeared, and the lady that sang that isn't really, doesn't do a lot of music anymore, but just even when things are hard, God is there. 
And that was something going on in our family, and I thought, I needed that, God, thank you. It just reminded me of his, of his love for me no matter what was happening. Sometimes a song will be a confirmation or a warning or even a prophecy that'll speak about what's going on around you. God will do anything to get our attention. We just need to stay alert for it. God speaks through people. God can speak to you through anybody. Uh, most often it's through other believers, but sometimes he'll speak to you through somebody that you don't even know, like the, guy in the, like the woman in the beauty parlor. Can you imagine Denzel Washington looking at her and, what is wrong with you, lady? I mean, just why are you looking at me? And then she, has, she, she shares a prophecy with him. Now that can happen. I don't say that it happens a lot, and some, but we have to be open to it. And if we're not, we're not gonna be, we're not gonna hear from him that way. But he does use people. Sometimes it's through a line or a word. It can be thrust for a regular conversation. Somebody confirming something that God's already told you. The beautiful thing about God is that he, he owns everybody, he created everybody, so he can use anybody to talk to you. Sometimes it might be totally, somebody totally not, not a believer, totally off the cuff, and you think, oh, that really helps me to see that more clearly, God, thank you. Don't underestimate or look down on anyone. They might be on an assignment to deliver you a word that you need to hear today. God can speak through repeated instances. When similar things reoccur over a space of time, it might be God calling your attention to something. God is not shy around you, and he doesn't keep mute because you're his child. He's your friend, and he, he wants to talk to you. He wants to warn you. I was thinking about getting ready for the baptism this Sunday. <laughs> There's been a few repeated instances over the last few weeks trying to change the date, evidently. I mean, first, first we had looked at the 11th, and we thought that would work, and then, she, then that didn't work, so then we moved it to today. And then that wasn't gonna work at the Nielsen's because of the lake and the weather and the water and all that. And so we changed it again, and we changed the place. I thought, okay, God, we evidently aren't supposed to do it today, because <laughs> then yesterday we had a lot more rain, and. It, even if we could get down to the swimming hole down there, I mean, to the area, I don't even think we could get into Camp Victory today down in that spot because it wasn't on the paved road. It was on a dirt road, dirt path. And I thought, we'd all be stuck down there for a long time. So we're going to try it next week. And we are going to do it one way or the other next week. We're going to, because, but, you know, God works that way. There would be those repeated things in your life that are just doors closing. And if you, you know, you can pound them down and get through them sometimes and find out that you are, were in, are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or sometimes there'll be doors opening, that you've prayed for God to open doors, and all of a sudden you're in the right place at the right time. Kind of like when we opened South Troy. We, Gary and I went around and, and drove around the community and prayed. We didn't walk around the block and pray. We drove around and prayed and tried to see if God wanted us here. And just through a number of events, he really revealed to us we were in the right place at the right time. Just, you know, money coming in and, and the, the feeling in the community and the support, all those things came together to be open doors. So God does that through repeated instances. Remember, there are no coincidences. Pay attention and try to hear what God is saying to you always. God speaks through circumstances. He can use either yours or somebody else's to teach you a lesson or encourage you, give you a promise. There are always a deeper purpose when you find yourself in trials. I mean, sometimes the hardest things you go through teach you the most. Actually, probably most of the time, the hardest things that you go through will teach you a lot. They'll teach you a lot about yourself. They'll teach you a lot about your trust in God. We had, um, I think, I think that's where, oh, that's down there farther. I want to share something. But yeah, when you're, sometimes when you're broke, God wants to teach you something about perseverance or patience or teach you how to manage your money better. Sometimes it's, you know, there's all different ways that God uses our circumstances to teach us. God speaks through dreams. God will speak to you through dreams once in a while. Um, some of us have weird dreams and we know they're not from God. And I can't, you know, not all of us are spoken to through dreams, but some people have a, have a spirit or have a sense of that so that they're listening more so. And God will speak to them through dreams. That happened in the Bible a lot of times. Um, the, during Ramadan, 
we have made it a practice, and a lot of us in the Wesleyan Church, or probably lots of Christian churches, to pray for Muslims during that time, to, to, for God to speak to them through dreams. They put a high, um, I can't think of the word I want, huh? Yeah, they really, they, they really believe that dreams speak to them. And often God does. We've had many circumstances in the church overseas where people that are in Ramadan, Muslims, have become Christians because God has revealed himself to them that, they, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then, so dreams are a wonderful way for them to become Christians and come to know who God is. And it is for us, too. Um, you know, God spoke to Joseph and Solomon, Jacob, Peter, John, and Paul. That sounds like a music group. Um, he spoke to them all through dreams at one time or another. So just an idea, something to try maybe. Um, pray before you go to sleep. Ask God if there's something you want to speak to me. You know, make me open to paying attention to my dreams tonight. And maybe he'll do that. Pay attention so you can know and decipher God's voice clearly too. Don't just go on a rampage. Just pay attention because anything that God does tell you will always agree with his word. He'll never go against his character. He'll never go against his word. So always, you know, double check those things. We talked about that a lot last Sunday. Um, God speaks through visions. Now, visions are different than dreams. They're basically, they're almost like daydreams. They're something that God just kind of reveals to you. It could be a quick flash or a whole scene or an inscription. God could be showing you in the future, like for that woman that gave the prophecy to um, Denzel Washington. Or, or it could be somebody like, um, Morgan Freeman talking to that lady at the at the restaurant just saying hey you know God works in this way and it, you know just kind of a vision of what God is trying to show you but, but as we build a stronger relationship with God, with God especially during prayer and fasting he'll find ways to reveal himself to you in different different than maybe you're more than you're comfortable with at first but be open to hearing what God has to say to you develop a solid prayer life God speaks to us through prayer. Once you start to pray on focusing on God, he'll lead you. He wants you to listen. You know, usually we think of praying as a one-way deal. We sit there and we pray. We, we thank God for things. We tell him how wonderful the day is. We praise him and we, we're supposed to do all those things. But spend some time listening. For some of us that talk a lot and have our minds are going, you know, you're, they're always going. It's very hard to sit and listen sometimes and really hear what God has tried to say to you. I've made it a practice to put a journal in front of me so I can write down what I feel God is saying to me. And that helps a lot because otherwise I am distracted. I have to put my phone way over there now or and I have to, and, but I, you know, I have a hard time. And I've really been working on it to really listen to God speak to me. And I find out it, it, it works, <laughs> he does. But you have, to, you have to be intentional about it. And sometimes God speaks through an audible voice. In the Bible, God spoke to Samuel. He said, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, speak, Lord, for I'm listening. And then God spoke to him out loud. Now, I don't know if anybody else could hear him speak, but God, sometimes we'll hear God. He'll, we'll, we'll think we heard a voice and you'll tell us something and we'll look around and we'll realize that God is talking to us. And again, always double check against his word, against his spirit, against, but God is, does want to talk to us and he does do that. Okay, he does that once in a while. I mean, he did it back then. Why, would, why wouldn't he do it now? It says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God speaks through his peace. An unhurried heart, unworried heart and spirit can be God talking to us and saying, yes, you're on the right track. That's kind of the best, you know, when you're following God and you've made a decision and a choice and you're, if you feel God's peace about it, you'll know that God is there with you. Oh, and Gary was having, Gary had a brain tumor in 92 and we had, we prayed about it and we had went forward with it and, you know, we had such a peace with God. We had no worries when he went into the hospital, neither of us. We were both very much at peace. In fact, when he talked to the nun that morning, when she came in and asked him if she, want, he could, she could pray with him, he said, you know, he goes, I'm okay. He goes, I know if it doesn't work and I don't make it through, I'm going to be in heaven with the Lord. And he said, otherwise, I haven't been worried about it. I know the doctor, you know, he had just a huge peace about him. And I was, you know, we, that Sunday before we went, 
I, I wasn't worried. I didn't even know I should be worried because some people would come up to me and they were worried for me, I guess. And they would come up and, and I thought, maybe I'm supposed to be worried. But we just had such a peace that God was in control of it that we didn't need to worry. And that's what God does when, when we know what we're doing and we know that we're following God, he gives us his peace. God speaks to us through the supernatural. These are the most fun, obviously, through miracles and signs and wonders. And he uses those to increase our faith. I, always, I still love the, the, what happened when we got the windows in the basement, when we had no money and we had no idea how they were going to get paid for. And when they arrived, those windows said, paid in full. But we had prayed to God that morning and said, God, these windows are coming today. We have no money in the account. We've spent everything everybody's given for the church. How are we going to pay for these? And we didn't have the money. And here they came, and it said, paid in full. God answered prayer. And that for us was a miracle. It was a sign that we were doing the right thing. Again, it was just his confirmation. And I'm sure all of us have seen times in our lives when there's no way to, to have had anything else happen, but it had to be God. It was a God thing. And to know that, and he will answer those things, and he will show us those things. He'll speak to us through those. When the Holy Spirit lives in us, we can hear him speak. Holy Spirit in our life will take our unholy life. It will convict us of the sin in our lives. It will help us to see that we need God. And when he does that, he will bring us, when we receive Christ and we repent of our sins, he forgives us. And he makes us as white as snow. He cleans us up totally and completely, making us holy before God. Isaiah, when he was at the throne and he was at the temple, and it was after King Uzziah died, he, he had a vision. And he saw these seraphim, and they were praising God, and they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. That's a pretty awesome vision right there. And then he said, it's all over. <laughs> I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. He recognized, that's God. And I'm sinful. I can't stand before God. He said, I have filthy lips, lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to him with a burning coal on, with, on a pair of tongs from the altar, and he touched Isaiah's lips with it. And he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. The Holy Spirit moves us from unholy to holy. Only we can stay, stand before God as holy people when we've received Jesus and, and been forgiven of our sins. And he brings convicted sinners to holy. Only he can convict us of sin and help us to see the holiness of God and the abject sinful state that we're in. When we confess our sins, he fills us and comes in and makes us holy. When we accept Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, we are made right with God. The Holy Spirit also guides us. He'll guide us to all truth. When we turn to the right or the left, he'll convict us. He'll prick our conscience. He will bring us to know the truth. And he says the truth will make us free. He will give us power to live the life that he's called us to do. He fills us with his power to change and follow Jesus. And lastly, the Holy Spirit turns us from living for ourselves in our own power to being filled with the power of God so that we are filled, filled so that we can go. Jesus said, go and make disciples. He said, you will receive power when you go to Jerusalem, Samaria, where not to remain the same. And the Holy Spirit comes in, he comes in to change us. When we accept Christ, we are a new creation. Next week, our baptism candidates will be coming forward and, and telling us the difference that Jesus makes in their lives, why they want, why they're coming, why they want to be baptized. Because they plan that they plan to follow God and with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a life made new. That's a life lived for God. That's a life filled with hope and love and peace. Once we agree about God with about our sinful state. We can be redeemed forever through the blood of Jesus Christ. We will be able to hear God's voice and follow him 
That's the highest calling. That's what we're here for. That's what we celebrate. That's what we celebrate during baptism. That's what we celebrate every Sunday, is being redeemed and set free from our sin and to live in the power of God. That's the highest calling that we can have. The kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. That's a calling. That's a life that is filled with God and that's a life ready to hear God's voice every day. Stay close, stay in the word, stay obedient, and he will direct your paths. Let's pray. Dear Father, I probably should say dear Holy Spirit, as we've talked to you and talked about you today, we thank you so much for coming in and filling us. As our song said, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Lord, I pray that we will welcome you here every single day, every single minute of our lives. Fill us with your presence and your power to live our lives for you. And check us when we're sinning, check us when we're going the wrong direction and speak to us. Help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see what your spirit says to us today and this week and all the days ahead. Thank you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you would stand with us, we'll sing our last song together. <laughs>